Archaeology and artificial intelligence. What the hell do those two things have in common? Well, I'll tell you, because the point of my talk today is to talk to you about cloud civilizations, where the savannah and the metaverse meet. When I was preparing for the TEDx talk, they said, um, make sure that you shock them, right, at the very beginning. So I thought, okay. They also told me to speak slowly, which I can't promise that, but I'm too excited about this topic. But, okay, shock them. Well, here we go, nice and easy. Two postulates today that I want to share with you. First of all, that nation states are dying. And second of all, that we need to evolutionarily adapt to the new reality of cloud civilizations. Okay, here we are. I'm asking for the second time in about 30 seconds already, what the hell does that mean? So let's start with some basic definitions just to set the playing ground. Basically, nation states are conglomerates, um, bits of people put together that have a shared culture, often have a shared ethnicity, shared language, often a shared currency. Um, the idea of the nation state and the history of a nation state is a complicated and a long one, but if we want to look into kind of more recent history, it first gets codified around the kind of peace of Westphalia, which was at the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, specifically the Treaty of Münster, um, we have the first mention of the nation states. But really, the nation states as we know them, there might be French people amongst you, British people amongst you, um, Czech people amongst you. That's really a post-World War II phenomenon. Basically, the era of decolonization, the kind of era of self-determination. So the nation states that we're living in are actually laughably modern, often less than 100 years. In kind of various uh, topics and various kind of areas of expertise, we see breadcrumbs everywhere of these kind of nation states kind of losing their function, losing their purpose and slowly deteriorating. Whether that's the biggest drop in the Democrat Democratic Index since 2006, inflation, various economic crises, record migration of people to technological platforms, increased rate of globalization despite the pandemic, and even academic postulates. So people like Das Gupta and many, many others are talking about the deterioration of the nation state. Cloud civilizations, right, okay, I, I, I'll be honest, I made this term up, right, because like every academic's got to have a term that they kind of make up and then they pretend to be very important about it. But basically, I believe that global civilizations, sorry, cloud civilizations that are global are essentially a digital blanket on the world as we know it. You can imagine them as telemedicine, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, online educational platforms that are not necessarily connected to any kind of state institution. And we kind of see them appearing slowly, like a 3D version of the internet that is connected to the real world, but is enabled and scaled thanks to modern technological platforms. However, um, as much as I would love to, and when I had the first iteration of my TED talk, it was about 45 minutes, about 60 slides, and they said, yeah, can you tone down the academic side a little bit, maybe talk about your life story instead. So I thought, okay, great. Um, chance would have it, a few weeks ago, I turned 30, so I realized, like the nation state, I'm slowly dying. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I thought, okay, I'll actually tell you how the hell I got to this place in the first place, why I'm an academic dedicating my life to this aloof term, terminus technicus of the cloud civilizations, because it's a big gamble. Um, so basically, I'll split the TED Talk into three kind of key periods of my life and the key lessons that I took from those that led me to the very point today and that something that I strongly believe in. Let's start off with a kid picture. It always gets them going. Right, so this is me um, looking very much like a boy, um, already with a little shovel, so you could see I was into archaeology from a very early age. Um, but I was a really curious kid, right? I loved everything. Like, uh, observe, please, my um, <laughs> certificate from multimedia studies from 1999, yeah? It was in Microsoft Paint, pretty much, but like, yeah, big, hardcore stuff. Um, I loved dogs, animals, archaeology massively, and I was just pretty much into absolutely everything. Um, uh, sorry, I'll get emotional here, but um, my family really, really supported me here. Um, and really um, supported me in this curiosity. And I've got my mum in the audience, uh, who was great and is great in supporting me in terms of doing what I want to do. Um, I was really lucky that I was in a very multidisciplinary family. So from my granddad's teaching me how engines of World War II planes work, to archaeology, to psychology, to learning to cook, um, I was a very, very lucky kid to have that support and all that curiosity. The breaking point, however, for me, um, I'm a bit of a mutt. I have Polish, Czech, Vietnamese blood in me. Um, and we moved to Vietnam in, in the year 2000, at the break of the millennium. 
And that was a massive, massive change. I started learning English, um, which basically became my kind of native tongue almost. I was exposed to a lot of different cultures. You can see, for example, this is actually quite a funny story. Um, uh, when we went on a trip to neighboring Cambodia, I was, of course, like completely t taken apart by the Angkor Wat temples. So much so that there was Michael Caine standing next to us the entire time, and my mom and dad were like, look, it's this really important guy. I was like, psh, psh, psh. Temples. Uh, so I completely missed the opportunity to say hi or whatever. But he's there in the picture, so I've got proof. So that's the most important thing. But this period of my life, this early period of my life, essentially taught me a couple of lessons. The first one was that borders are completely irrelevant. It really doesn't matter. I was exposed to an international education, loads of different cultures. We traveled somewhere basically every month. Um, and the second thing was that everything is connected. It really doesn't matter whether you're doing history or archaeology or philosophy or nuclear physics. It's essentially just a massive database of human knowledge that we've been accumulating over the past thousands of years and that we have found a way to connect. All of the data points are somehow connected. So that was the explosion in my childhood. Then came Oxford, right? Uh, uh, this, this is not one of those like bragging moments, oh yeah, you know, Oxford, but it was just like, one of the happiest periods of my life. I've wanted to go there ever since I was tiny. It was, as you can see, very serious education, no beer or pubs or party, very serious. Um, but I studied archaeology and anthropology. Um, then I specialized uh, in cognitive and evolutionary anthropology, specifically the evolution of symbolic thought and music under the late, unfortunately, Ian Morley. Um, and it was basically, it gave me the academic underpinning for everything that I was already so, so interested in. But then I was like, okay, I've, I've got the great education, what do I do with it? So I thought, okay, I um, know exactly what I'll do with it. I'll become a curator in the British Museum, uh, which was great, good idea, except I sent them about 15 applications and they responded to nada. Zero, nothing. So I thought, okay, that's maybe a bit of a change of plan needed. Need to evolutionarily adapt to the situation. Got rent to pay in London. So I went into the startup world. Um, and this was a big chunk of my career, a huge chunk of my career. I worked in uh, tech uh, throughout this entire time. I was, for example, uh, working on digital campaigns and politics. That was a lot of fun, a lot of interesting stories, but we were nonpartisan. So, for example, I uh, helped build both uh, sides of the digital infrastructure of Brexit. I worked on around 50 campaigns all over the world, including nonprofits, but also uh, corporate companies. I did artificial intelligence for museums and galleries, predicting visitation. I worked in Industry 4.0, using artificial intelligence to predict whether big machines are going to break or not. And I was, again, like seeing that really borders don't matter at all. I was working in teams where we had a nine-hour time difference. I was flying to 10 different places every month. It was just, you're, you're just living the life and using tech, and you don't really care who you're talking to or where you are at the moment. All you need is your debit card, and you're good to travel, maybe a passport as well. So what are the lessons that I learned from this period of my life? Uh, I'll be honest with you, it was an exceptionally difficult period of my life. It was roughly nine years. Um, the work was crazy. It was every day, four-hour commuting, 15-hour working days, waking up at 3 a.m. to take a call with Los Angeles to make sure that all the data that is leaking is actually going to be fine. It was a lot of fun, especially in politics. Uh, but the three key lessons that I learned was that, A, everything apart from evolution is a temporary social construct. Christmases, birthdays, TED Talks, nation states, it is a social construct. Um, the second of all was that tech can solve virtually any problem. I'm not like a crazy, aloof tech optimist, but we've literally got tools to solve pretty much any problem in the world. And third of all, people don't really understand tech. So often, I'd be up against a senior innovation manager who didn't know what artificial intelligence was, but he was buying it and spending millions of pounds on it. So many times, I came across someone who just had no idea how an Excel spreadsheet works properly. So there was a huge, huge gap, no matter what startup I worked in, between the potential of the technology and the way that people actually understood it. After this period, um, I returned back into the Czech Republic, um, and I kind of I started missing archaeology a lot and anthropology as well. Um, and I, uh, COVID came, and all of these lessons that I learned in my time in this tech sector became even more woefully critical than ever before. We were in a time of crisis, and we weren't able to deal with it, although we have the tools to do so. 
new kind of social problems came up, and every day they were getting more accentuated, more problematic, whether it's the erosion of trust, fake news, conspiracy theories, questioning of democracy, and whether even it's the optimal social structure, the war in Ukraine, death of the nation state, but on the other hand, you have all the tools that you could possibly dream of. Like, Ramses II would probably like, cut off his right arm to have at least, at least a portion of those tools that we have now. Whether it's the metaverse, Web 3.0, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, we can deal with those problems, but the dialogue isn't going on. So I thought, okay, I'll start talking about it. And I was talking about it, and I was going around various cities, and I would have like five people listen to me, and I was like, yeah, archaeology, woo, technology, great. Um, I became a member of like 10 different projects, either managing them or being part of them with very mixed success. Um, uh, there, there were definitely screw ups along the way. And I just became a, a completely like uh, unorganized, unfocused, and I was spread way, way too thin. And so I thought, okay, I need to do something about that. But I knew that what I was onto is going to be important for the 21st century in navigating the chaos that we're in. The lessons from this period were, A, again, that social structure as we know it is collapsing, but that's not a bad thing. A lot of academics like Jared Diamond or the famous Czech Egyptologist Miroslav Barta, they talk about the collapse of civilizations, but we have bad connotations associated with collapse. It's a transformation. It's an opportunity for a phoenix moment. So it's collapsing, but that's fine. We should relish that as an evolutionary opportunity. Second of all, that people seek refuge in technological solutions, like cryptocurrencies, like NFTs, like all of these things. It's, it's becoming to have a mass adoption, or if you saw the AI algorithms like Midjourney um, or DALI, like people are starting to really kind of get into the tech world. However, uh, that has a downside, and that is social stratification. Um, we need to make sure that we don't get into the situation that only the kind of privileged people with the access to the information, not necessarily wealthy people, but access to information, don't create these technological elites, and they survive the chaos, but the rest don't. So it's very important that during times of crisis, we have bottom-up education and a decentralized education that can bring those tools to people and make them available. So, what did we decide to do? Um, uh, essentially, I thought, okay, this is 30 years of my life, I've got these things that I want to do, what's the smartest thing? Yeah, go into academia. Perfect, that'll pay the rent. Um, but <laughs> essentially what we've done is me and a couple of similarly uh, insane people have started a research group where I don't just want to talk about these big concepts in an empty way, but I want to research them academically. So what we've done is that we're going to be recreating Plato's polis in virtual reality and basically using it as a testing ground, as a testing bed for ethics, for morality, and to find the kind of lowest common denominator of what makes a society evolutionarily resilient. To give you a little bit of context on Plato, because Plato is just very complex and he always thought he was very important, um, that, but that's mainly because all of his written work survived until this day. He wrote The Republic in 375 uh, BC, and essentially he kind of laid out the utopian social structure, what the ideal city-state should be. He had three categories of people. Philosophers at the very top, <laughs> of course, talk about a self-fulfilling prophecy. Good PR, Plato. Second of all, the guardians, so the warriors, people pr protecting the entity. And third of all, the commoners. If you think that this utopia was functional, think again. Um, Plato was actually a bit of an antique eugenicist because, for example, he thought that it's the philosopher's task to decide which commoners breed with whom to produce the ultimate kind of next generation that will serve the city-state in the best way possible. So, a bit of Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. However, we know that his postulates are necessarily right or true, but we want to use this antique setting of the polis to test out various things like when will people get pissed off with the system? When will they stop paying taxes? Will they break off and start a new society? And we want to test these things and we will find out what society is actually made of, the anatomy of civilization. Right, you're probably sitting there and thinking, okay, that's great, but like, I still need to eat and like, pay my rent and like, switch on the light, so how is all of this useful? Uh, well, it is, trust me, and it, not just because I'm crazy and I love the topic, um, but when we, if we actually want to survive as a human species, we have to understand that civilization, any civilization, is temporary, that it is a social construct. The nation-state is a part of that kind of wheel going on and on and on throughout human history. 
If we want to become a multi-planetary species and colonize Mars, imagine after six months on Mars, you, you don't care what nationality someone is. If someone steals your breakfast ration, you will probably smother them in their sleep because you're hungry and you're just trying to spend your time cultivating potatoes, and then suddenly, before you know it, half of your food ration is gone. The tribal evolutionary instincts will kick in because as much as we don't like to admit it, we have an animal brain going on there. So we want to make sure that even in the most difficult times, even in the most difficult, challenging circumstances, we can use technology to basically simulate this lowest common denominator of our society, understand the anatomy of it, and make sure that we survive, whether it is Mars or anywhere else, and just to be aware of that fact, not to think that we have reached the pinnacle of civilization, because we haven't. Make sure that we're resilient and can evolutionarily survive. One of my biggest role models and one of my favorite kind of like steampunk-esque turn of the century um, novels of all time and authors is Gilles Verne. Um, and uh, his 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, there's the uh, personality of Captain Nemo. Captain Nemo uh, was basically so fed up with the steam-powered world of the kind of dry land that he thought, you know what, this isn't serving my purpose anymore. And he was the first, he was a pioneer, he was the first person to essentially adopt electricity, to make his submarine, the Nautilus, fully autonomous, and to essentially live a free, independent life and create his own structure that was close to the truth, that was close to being resilient, and that was evolutionarily plausible. And this quote, I really want you to accompany you throughout your lives, not just after you leave today, that we may brave human laws, but we can absolutely not resist natural ones. So what do I want you to do? Um, this will be the cheesy bit of the presentation, but like, trust me, this is needed. I want you to be the Captain Nemos of the 21st century. I want you to defy the system. I want you to realize that what you're living in is a social construct, and that's fine. We'll be creating these social constructs forever and ever because we're humans, we do that kind of stuff. But I want you to be able to invent and create the structures, not just live in them. You've got all the tools available, so use them. And that's where the savannah and the metaverse meet. Thank you very much.